Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and today I am joined yet again for a four-peat, five-peat, I'm not sure how <laughs> many times. It's a lot of times, but we're always happy to have him on. Craig Campbell, how are you doing? Hello. Hey. Uh, now, uh, now, Craig, uh, you are w- probably one of the most prolific among game designers that I've had on the show. I, th- I think you've literally made seven games every year for the entirety of time, right? <laughs> well, not, not quite that, but I'm at, uh, let's see, MNA Capers, one, two, three, Pirates, which is short, die laughing. Technically, I guess, like seven significant game books that okay. include supplements, you know? Okay. Um, and, then, and then there was like a little thing that I did that was like four little games, and then this is, this is game number eight or book number eight. That's still pretty prolific. I didn't realize that I was like doing that, if, that I was quote unquote prolific, but I've had a few different people say that to me over the last year or so. Mm. And people ask like, well, how do, you, how do you like do so much? How do you keep on track? And I was like, well, you know, it helps to have supplements. Yep. Because you're not like, you're not inventing a whole new game. And it also helps to not be married and have no children. Yes, yes. These are also factors that really do help. I found it very useful for my for my productive career too. Yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised how much energy in the day when you don't have like loved ones you have to worry about. You've got loved ones you worry about, but they're none of them are in the house, and you don't have to deal with them That's right true. in the moment all the time. You this know, is you're true. you're not you're not torn in that direction to yeah. uh, to like form yeah. your duties and responsibilities for all the people that depend on you oh i understand that, uh, oh, yeah. that want your time oh yes i can, I can just crunch i can just crunch on games here and there i know the people that i uh share a domicile with not too long ago were like oh we, there there are some kittens we should get kittens and i'm like oh man this is a like i understand i like cats and everything but at the same time um there there's one more thing <laughs> and i'm gonna have to think about well, on the upside, mm-hmm. kittens become cats. So, like, true. The, the 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 rambunctiousness of the kitten, yeah, is replaced by the sort of lazy attitude of <laughs> most cats. Right. Um, like if you got if you got a dog, depending on the oh. breed, like that dog's a dog the whole time until like age starts to catch up with it. Oh yeah. So, like if you want if you want some excitement for a while, yeah, get a kitten, and then you can just have like you know, a quiet companion that mostly tolerates you for the remainder of its life. Yes, absolutely. And the uh, the thing is, is that like yeah, they're only a couple months old, so right now it's just yeah. running nonstop. Super so um, kitty, kitty yeah. crazy, super kitty. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> so yeah, looking forward to them getting old <laughs> right <laughs> now. But anyway. Uh, so usually when you're on, we're, we're talking about capers, which I'm, I'm always happy to talk about, but we actually have a different project that we're talking about now. So, so please give me a little bit of a synopsis about, uh, Good Strong Hands. Good Strong Hands is a, uh, tabletop role-playing game where you portray, uh, like fantastical creatures or humans from earth who have traveled to this realm called reverie and you are working to save it from destruction by this horrible malevolent force known only as the void um, and the void pops up every few centuries tries to destroy reverie and heroes must rise up and you are playing one of those heroes okay uh, why uh why did you call it reverie well, I needed a, a name for a fantastical world, and I liked the idea of, of not just like making up a name, but like actually using a word that means something Sure. Um, in English. And a reverie is a daydream. Mm. Um, so it just kind of like in the game, um, you, the, the players and the GM work together to kind of build the game as you go build the world so there's basic there's some basic information that's provided in the game book but there's a lot of expectation um and uh uh, prompting by the gm of the players to help to build the world so like to describe what the what your folk are like and to describe describe what the world is like what what the geography is like and what the towns and cities are like and what Mm -hmm. you know uh, kingdoms attitudes and and their histories are and so forth um so it felt like reverie fit because it 
Reverie is a daydream. It's like you could imagine like you're just kind of sitting around just like imagining up this world yourself, like in a daydream, just kind of like, what would it be like to you know be in this wonderful, fantastical place with all these like weird creatures, um, these magical beings. Um, and then of course, you know, you have to inject it with a bunch of conflict and have like this thing that wants to destroy it all. <laughs> right, right, right. I see. So, so Reverie kind of as a concept almost sounds like uh, almost like theater of the mind in how you uh in, in in how you utilize it which is great for rpgs anyway because i'm usually thinking of it in those terms but you're taking it quite literally uh, you're kind of just dreaming it up together yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, and rather than having a whole bunch of lore to digest or for the gm to dole out as you play um you invent a lot as you're going okay okay so that process because you know technically we are a mechanics show I, I no no one really even knows that anymore, but we do we do mostly oh, talk. Okay. About, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the genesis was that we were talking about game mechanics, and then we kind of just did design in general because we there was so much else that we wanted to talk about. But uh, since we are technically a I guess a design show, uh, I sure. did I did want to talk a little bit about how that is implemented when we're actually getting into the gameplay. So tell me a little bit about the process of uh, developing. I, I'm taking it that this is not exactly the same system that you were making for like capers or die laughing or anything like that. You you built something new for this. I'm a sucker. Um, <laughs> I build a new system for every game that I do because okay. I decide that like there's well there's a thing I want this game to do and I could take this other system that I've designed or another system that's like out there that's like licensable or open license or whatever. And I could try to ram my concept into that thing and kind of tweak. But ultimately I was just, you know, like I want a, uh, a mechanic, this, like this game, I wanted to keep it simple. I want the, uh, I want task resolution to not be uh, bi uh, binary. I want there to be, you know, different variations of things that can happen. And I want, I want failure to be, interesting and useful and i want uh even success to be surprising mm, okay um so i kind of worked those sorts of things just to keep like keep things theoretical to begin with but we can we can dive into the actual mechanics if you want right because i'm, I'm kind of wondering how you implemented that uh how how do you do that in terms of the actual mechanics um well it's a simple system um, you've got four traits, and that's going to govern most of what you do. Um, body, mind, charm, and heart. And they're all kind of what they sound like. Mm -hmm. um, and each of them is going to be rated one through four, um, higher being better. When you have uh, a task that you wish, wish to attempt that you know has like real chance of failure, real consequences, um, you'll make a trait check, and you'll roll a number of D6s equal to your rating in the appropriate trait. And you're shooting for a target number of four, five, or six, determined by the GM, um, with the with the intention of getting at least one success um, on a die. At least one of the dice will equal or exceed the target number. I see. Okay. Okay. So this makes sense to me because the more dice that you have, the better your odds of hitting that four, five, or six. Right. I, I I get you. I get you. Now now, what happens with extra successes? Well, um, kind of working from the bottom up, let's do this. Uh, okay. If you fail, if you don't get any hits, you know, none of the dice hit the target number, yep. um, you, 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 you don't succeed at the task, and the GM um, can introduce a complication. So there'll okay. be something that'll kind of mess up the story. Um, but you also mark a skill, which is a, a checkbox track that's on your character playbook. Um, and there's, uh, when you fill up the skill track, you advance your character in some way. So you learn through failure. Okay. Okay. Um, if you succeed with exactly one die hitting the target number, you succeed on the check um, and uh, on, on the, in the task and you gain uh, a spirit. You mark one spirit on the spirit track. Um, and spirit is a, uh, is a currency in the game. You'll, you'll gain points and spend points for different reasons. Hmm. Okay. Um, so it, you don't sit, you don't sit on them necessarily. You'll you'll use them up. Okay. If you if you get two or more successes um, on the dice, two or more hits, um, you succeed. You gain a boon, which is to say you you know you do better. There's some extra aspect to your success, mm -hmm. and you mark one uh, shadow, which is another track that you will uh, mark to fill up. 
and shadow represents the void seeing that you are capable and a hero and it decides it's going to try to corrupt you so it plants seeds of of doubt and shadow and darkness in you and if you if you fill up your shadow track you gain a corruption oh. which is a power it's it's a and it's usually a pretty interesting and uh, maybe even powerful um, ability mm-hmm. but it comes from a dark place it comes from the void um, and then if you gain too many corruptions and you fill up your shadow track again you you lose your character to the void your your character becomes an agent of the void come fallen oh okay i do i don't don't want that or i do want that i oh. i feel like i'm going to be powerful <laughs> but i'm also that that doesn't sound good to me like <laughs> well there's a lot of ways to play it some people might resist the the corruptions outright and try to offset their shadow because you can spend spirit on that currency right to stop uh, to keep from marking shadow okay um uh, and then uh, you can you know you can potentially gain a corruption or even two and not really be in danger of falling over to the void yet it's after you gain that third corruption um mm-hmm. that things are like eh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly. exactly um so okay. it becomes a question of kind of walking the line and the game is sort of designed to like if you if you if you play long enough and you roll enough dice um there's going to be enough times that you're not going to have the spirit available to offset that shadow and you're going to gain some so you're going to gain a corruption and you can't, you can't you could in time um fall to the void it's just a question of well then maybe you want to defeat the void once and for all or at least for this round um mm. uh for this arrival um before you do fall over to the void okay no, but now if i if i defeat the void can I no longer fall? Like, do I get any corruption power? Like, do, am I am I getting rid of all of my corruption because I defeated the void? If the void is where the power stems from, I get, uh, um. Well, the the if you defeat the void, the game is effectively over. Like that campaign is effectively done. Oh, perfect. Um, okay. <laughs> so I, I, you know what? I I've never really, um, like, well, what happens to the corruptions after the void is gone? Because <laughs> um, <laughs> after the void is gone, you're not playing the game anymore. Right. <laughs> um, I would. I would imagine you carry that corruption with you. Okay. Um, and that, like, the void doesn't. You don't destroy the void completely. Like, it's. It's just. It's. It's the manifestation of entropy. Um, it's okay. ever present. It's going to come back eventually. You just. You're just keeping it from destroying the world now. Sure. So, and should you, if you, if you were playing a long-lived type of folk, um, you could ostensibly, you know, play your characters feed the void, gain some corruptions in the process, and then, okay, and then the GM says, okay, and now we fast forward 200 years to when the void comes again. Oh. You are still, you know, and now you're the old version um, mm-hmm. of, of that character. That could be an interesting twist on the campaign. You play through two defeats of the void. Mm. Um, once as a young, uh, as a youngling, you know, as like all full yeah, of, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and full of stars. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once as like the the kind of jaded older um, character that has carried the corruption, carried their war wounds, so to speak, yeah. with them throughout their life. Oh yes. Now they're they're called they're called upon again to step up and defeat the void. Yes, yes. I had an idea for a for a campaign that was kind of like that. You know, because you usually take out you know heroes when they're they're fresh faced and new, and they're going yep. out into the world to do adventuring. And I kind of had this interesting idea of, um, well, what if you had your, your party had gone out into the world and they had defeated, you know, like a demon that was threatening the world. And then they went off to their regular lives, you know, and they they started their kind of like, you know, civilian lives. And then it turns out that, that the thing they thought they had defeated was not defeated and was just biding its time to come back even stronger. And now they're called back into service 20 years later. And uh, and have to be like, ah, oh, man, we gotta go do this again. <laughs> have, to, have to find. All right, let's go back out. I guess <laughs> just you know, a little bit older, a little bit worse for wear. Kind of you know, out of the adventuring life, probably. Kind of got used to not going out and slaying monsters, and then somebody calls upon them and says, 
uh, yeah, but you're the only ones with actual experience defeating this thing, so we kind of need you to do that because no one else, <laughs> no one else, like we, all the all the fresh faced adventurers, they're getting killed by this. You have to come out and do it. Uh, I always thought that was an interesting idea because you know it's it it's so paradoxical to what you normally think of for like uh, a, your typical RPG party. You you usually figure they're starting out; it's the first time and everything's new and fresh and what if you just had veteran adventures and they were going, they, they had to do it and they're not they're not even happy about it they don't even want to do it hey, hey nathan yeah i have designed the alpha version of that exact game perfect <laughs> perfect it's called tentatively titled one last dungeon Ooh. Um, where it's just, yeah, it, it's the idea you're playing retired adventurers who are completely out of practice. Um, all the skills are there, but they've forgotten them. They're really rusty. And so they have to go yes. back into one last dungeon and fight the bad thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the story is, is about them remembering how to do all that stuff. Ooh, perfect. So, and so when they start out, they're really bad at it. And yes. They fail a lot. Yes. Um, but then as they go along, they kind of get their legs under them again. Yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've toyed around with that idea. Yeah, I, I just like the idea of you have the experience and the knowledge, but you know, time has taken a bit of a toll on you. Maybe not so much for like an elf as for a human, but still, time marches on. But that's cool. Okay, so, <laughs> so I already okay, so you've already made that game for me. See, this oh is... no, no, I've I've, <laughs> I've 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 written a little bit of it and I play tested okay. a little bit and it's kind of sitting on a shelf right now. It's oh, not, okay, it's not made by any means. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, it's on a shelf somewhere waiting to be played. I still consider that mission accomplished. That's okay. I I go with that. This <laughs> this is good in the bag. One last dungeon. You're good to go. Yeah, and it's it's it acronym is old. Last <laughs> dungeon, old. Perfect. So so I I, my, I envision the book title being um e each word on a line and it being left justified. Yeah. So that you get old top to bottom. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's a play on red. Retired, a little bit extremely dangerous. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Congratulate! I don't have to envision this anymore. Someone thought about this before me. That's perfect. And someone we'll return to it someday. Yeah, you might. You might. Well, you are one of the most prolific game designers. Right. It'll be one of the seventy-seven that I create the next year. It will be one of the seventy-seven, the new forty-two from Craig Campbell. Good yes. lord! There you go. There's there's the uh, there's the goal. We need to. Well, you know, bigger, stronger hands. That's, you know, we, 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 there's follow-ups. There's obviously follow-up. But anyway, what was I telling? Oh, right. Uh, what happens to corruptions once you... <laughs> what are some... Yeah, of... I don't know. <laughs> okay. The campaign's over. The, the campaign's yeah. over. We don't need to think too much about it past that. What are some of the corruptions <laughs> that, you, that you get, that you can get? Oh, boy. What are some of the fun ones? Let me, let me roll down the list real quick. So there are some... Like, every, every playbook has three corruptions and they're they're tailored to the type of folk that you're playing right okay so they kind of they kind of fit kind of the theme of the folk um one of my favorites is for the fawns which are your uh you know your kind of uh hand style fawn you know like performers very legged goat goat people half goat people they perform um and they have uh one of their corruptions is endless dance where they can cause a creature to dance forever oh my um yeah, that's a really nasty corruption. It you mark you don't just mark a shadow when you use it. You mark two permanent shadow because it effectively removes that creature from the storyline completely. Oh, oh anything wow. that kills or removes a a, a target from the storyline completely is super expensive. Yeah, um, because it's 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 straight up murder. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one I was really proud of the uh, the name for this one. Imps have a. Uh, and, and, you know, and they're mildly devilish, right? Mm -hmm. They have a corruption called Greatest Trick. Mark a shadow, and one sapien creature forgets you exist. They can't see or hear you and don't remember you. Oh. Um, and that is that is blatantly pulled from Ezra Soze. <laughs> Say, in Usual Suspect, saying the greatest trick the dev devil ever pulled was convincing you he didn't exist. Right. Well, oh, right. yeah, the imp pulls the greatest trick. It's like they just, you just completely forget them. Well, there's something. I, so that's the Kaiser Soze. That's pulling a Kaiser Soze. A little right. bit. 
great, great, <laughs> love it. Uh, when, while I'm looking at the uh, the Kickstarter page, the uh character that I'm seeing, I think that this is the example that you're giving is for the Wildkin, uh, which I I appreciate because it looks like they're an otter people, and I like one, otters. Yes. Yeah, that one. Uh, half. <laughs> yeah, there's you. You can be a. There's a bunch of different mammal type people that you can be. There's foxes and you know fox, wildkin, otters, um, mm -hmm. rabbits, and badgers, all described. But most people are probably going to be the otter. Yeah. Um, well, the great thing is, <laughs> I hadn't come up with the otter thing. I only had the other three in a play test, and somebody said, "Why aren't there otter kin?" Mm -hmm. I said, "There are now." Yeah. <laughs> um, because I immediate I immediately latched on what I can do to make, because the, the thing about Wildkin is they all have like a mode of, of movement mm -hmm. that they're really, really good at. So foxes run, rabbits jump, badgers burrow. Um, and I was like, oh, well, otters, okay, they swim. So like, you know, like immediately, like that was easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can play an otterkin and you can, you can transform into an otter and you can swim really well and you can talk to other otters. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I get the other ones like a fox and I, and fox is a good one and, and rabbit yeah I, I can totally understand there's whole book series about rabbits and foxes but and and ba yeah. and badger i mean you don't mess with honey badgers but um, <laughs> but i mean the second otter pops up it's like oh yeah obviously people are going to want to be the otter that's just people, adorable people people <laughs> love otters yeah yeah, and that's why that's why the otterkin ended up being like I had to I had to choose between the four, right? I had to yeah. pick one to have on the on the playbook. Yeah. I was like, why not the otterkin? Because they're just, so cute. Just the otters. I mean, come on, we kind of have to. Um, you know how otters otters have a favorite rock that they keep as like a toy and tool. Yeah, she's she's throwing a little rock in the air. I see that. That's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. Um, there's there's all sorts of little. Um, like whimsical bits kind of in there. Some are, some are things I came up with that I put into the art orders and some are things that the artist came up with. Um, if you, if you go up to the, or you actually go down, sorry, to the, the six folk that are all laid out there. Mm. Um, you'll see that the wood can on the right, the tree guy. Yeah. Um, he's got a bird's nest in his hair. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was not in the art order. That was the artist who totally got what I was trying to do yeah. and said, oh, I'm going to put a bird's nest up there and have little birds yeah. flying around. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Just have a bird nest up there. Perfect. I love that. That's, that's, that's terrific. But uh, I, like I was thinking to myself, well, I'll look at some of the corruptions for the Wildkin, and the first one that comes up is Destroy Bonds, and that just sounds horrible because it's... <laughs> It's let's see, mark one shadow, sunder the emotional bond between two other creatures. <laughs> I, I'm just like, ooh, vicious. <laughs> um, yeah. Just, just well, like, the corruptions are, they're, they're icky, they're nasty. The void is trying to destroy an entire world. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're all over the place from like just killing to like punishing and and really hurting people on an emotional level and there's all sorts of stuff in there so like yeah like if if your character somehow went up against a a fallen wildkin and they used that destroy bonds on you normally in in the in the description it just says you you know you mark a shadow and you just do it but when you're playing a hero whenever something's used like something like that is used against you you get to resist it so oh. you get a chance to to avoid it because you're a hero um i see so but if but if you don't resist it like they could conceivably like destroy the um the bond between you and one of one of the other members of the party like you the two characters just don't care about each other anymore and that could have all sorts of implications wow. in the campaign that's uh that's scary so i mean adorable otter but uh don't don't <laughs> mess with otter i do like the idea of having those corruptions like because it does feel like yeah they, these are these are great powerful things and also uh, will will absolutely you know darken your soul by <laughs> utilizing them. Absolutely, and it's it's described in the book too that like there's a cosmetic change to your character. Like you need to as you gain corruptions, like out something about your nothing that's going to cause a specific disadvantage or affect the rules. But there's like something about you changes. Maybe your hair becomes all disheveled and matted, or your eyes turn gray or black, or oh, um, yeah. you know, you can never get completely clean. Um, and you're all, you always smell, you know, there's just like, pick a yeah. thing that just like, cause oh, as a character falls to corruption, it becomes apparent that they're, they're tainted in some way, which can, again, also affect, um, your interactions with NPCs and yeah, so yeah, forth. yeah, 
reminds me of like when uh when I'm playing an RPG and they have the morality scale and uh if you go to the dark side <laughs> You see your character's appearance start to get, like, gray and veiny, and maybe they grow horns or something like that. It's yeah. uh, sort of like that kind of idea. Uh, yeah. That's, uh... There's, there's an illustration that has not been done yet that'll be done as part of finishing up the Kickstarter. I'll come. Uh, that's going to be a side-by-side of the same pixie twice. Mm. Um, here's the pixie completely without corruption, and here's the pixie very corrupt. So you'll see, like... Ooh. We're going to have, you know, like um, sallow skin and dark eyes and um, their wings will be mangled and wow, wow. You know, messy hair and dirty yeah. and everything. Yeah. Dark pixies. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Like uh, on the one hand, kind of scary. And on the other hand, way cooler. That was always me. It's like, I know that I'm like supposed to be evil now, but also damn that looks good <laughs> like like that's a cool looking character model <laughs> that they come up with for your fallen heroes so yeah so corruptions use them responsibly then also talents on that layout i was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about uh those talents what what you have how you know what you have well right you've got a series of talents here's here's the thing what's on that page that you're looking at mm. Ultimately, it's going to be a little different in the final. I made some changes. Okay. Um, but, but without getting into the, the specifics um, of the differences, basically your character, every, every character has a, um, a talent that they have to make a choice on. Like with Wildkin, it's what, what type of Wildkin you are. So there's, there's like a sub, subgroup or a sub folk or sub, sub race or whatever mm -hmm. um, that each, each person for each you pick for your character and then that has like slightly different connotations mm -hmm. um, um and then you have additional talents and so you'll start with you'll start with some and you'll gain more as you advance so like when i was talking about when you when you fill your skill track every time you fill that up you erase everything and you advance your character mm -hmm. one of the things you can do is increase one of your traits by one up to a maximum of four or you can select another talent Oh, okay. Character knows. So you can you can build up those talents, and some of the talents um, are just straight up like they give you this ability. Some of the talents um, modify roles. Some of the talents are specifically magic oriented. Mm. Um, some of the talents require they're they're a little more powerful, so you have to spend spirit to use them. So you can tailor your character a lot of different ways. You can potentially play. You could have two um, two wildkin in the group at um, unless you manage, unless you play long enough that everybody fills up everything, mm -hmm. um, you could have, you could potentially have two wildkin in the group that are very different, very right. different traits, sc trait scores, and uh, a different selection of talents. I see. I see. Do you have a certain number that you start out with? Um, uh, well, uh, you normally you would start with, as it's drawn on the page that you're looking at, you started with those three. I see. Um, but like okay. I said, that has changed. Oh, okay. Okay. Now yeah, you you yeah. actually you actually only start with the one that you make a choice on. There's another thing that's going to be in the game that's going to kind of take the place of one of them. Okay. Um and then um I got a number of playtesters saying that like for starting level characters it would they they wanted to rein it back in a little bit, like not have quite as many talents to start with. Want you want something to look forward to, something to build to. So sure. I reduced that a little bit. Um and that's not to say you can't house rule it and play it you want to or even play characters that are half advanced up you know through they have a bunch of talents um sure. but for the base for the baseline you'll start with a little less so that you'll have something to build to I see. because when you start out your your traits aren't so good um and you're going to be failing roles and so you're going to be marking skill plenty mm -hmm. and you're going to start gaining more talents or increasing your traits like as you go by the time you get long into a campaign your traits are better you're not marking skill as often so you're not gaining stuff as quickly i see except I but actually what happens is it all shifts to now you, when your traits become better, you don't fail as often. So you don't mark skill, but you succeed with two or more. Mm -hmm. It's more often. So you mark shadow. So you do continue to advance. You just advance with corruptions. Right. Okay. Because your roles force you to mark shadow more. This is, uh, <laughs> th th this is good. So I'm getting yeah, bigger, better, faster, stronger. And now, and now also more corrupt -er. It's easy. Yeah, to that's the corrupt. That should be on the back of the book. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. Bigger, strong faster. hands, more corruptier. <laughs> yeah, this is the corruptiest. 
of all the corrupties. <laughs> <laughs> this is the corruptiest. Welcome to Big Strong. <laughs> I hope have you ever wanted to? Is. Have you ever wanted to run a corruptathon? Yeah, a this corruptathon. Is a game for you. Corruptathon brought to you by Craig Campbell, the most prolific game designer. This is his 126th game this year. 126th game this year, exactly. Corruptathon <laughs> is the follow-up supplement book, though. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's the first supplement. It's just Corruptathon, <laughs> and it's all. Well, it's, all it's all the supplements have. <laughs> All yeah. the supplements need to be plays off of the word corrupt. So it'll be like, yeah, the, the corruptathon. Welcome to the corruption dome. You know, just pick a yeah, yeah. corrupt <laughs> nomicon. <laughs> yeah, pick, just wedge the word corrupt. Abrupt and corrupt. You can have so many fun ones at that point. I don't, I don't understand why the supplements went so dark. The book looks like a fairy tale. <laughs> this got All the dark. supplements are corrupt. This got really dark. Like, remember Lord of the Rings? This, <laughs> the, design, the designer must be having a really bad year. <laughs> yeah. I think he's going through some stuff. I know that he might yeah. feel under pressure from making those 150 different... <laughs> but, you Has know, somebody reached out to him? Is he okay? I'm not sure. I think he, he needs a friend. And every single time you do a supplement, it's just like what happens on layers upon layers of what happens with your corruption. That's just more corruption. Yeah, it's just more. You got corruption. seven sheets of corruptions. It's just seven sheets of yeah. There's three talents and there's twenty five different corruptions. On the upside, it never falls to the void. Yeah. You just keep getting more corrupt and never quite give it up completely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like and now like, you're playing the anti-hero evil game, and uh... yeah, absolutely. Well, it's like, it's like I was talking to you before, like, well, what happens to your corruptions after the Void is, like, what if what if there was just the supplement, and it's like, after the Void is defeated, yeah, I'm still corrupt, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to keep going, I, I'm going to start a corruptathon. It's So it's like Battle Royale. <laughs> just get to, yeah, you'll creatures. get together all the corrupted heroes, and yeah. that'll, be the, that'll be the Corruption Dome, everybody will get together and fight in the Corruption Dome. <laughs> yes, yes, welcome, welcome to Corrupt Dome. <laughs> We're going in. <laughs> Hope everybody likes to see otters having a fist, having a, a knife fight. Or, no, with rocks. They'd be just tossing yeah. rocks at each other. It's a straight-up rock fight. Just a straight-up rock fight. <laughs> it's, it's just that, hey, you know what? I'd, I'd pay gold to see that. I definitely would. Um, so, anyway, yeah, there's, there's something to look forward to in good, strong hands. <laughs> Good strong corruptions. Good strong corruptions. Absolutely, absolutely. So when um, back back to the actual game. Um, <laughs> when it comes, uh, so so uh, talk a little bit about Wild. Can you mention a, a couple of the others? But let's just go over some of the different um, uh, character species that we have. Uh, in addition to obviously my favorite otters, the the wild kin, and and uh-huh. and, and and our favorite tree people. Uh, and the and the uh, fairies or the the fae, um, pixies, yeah, yeah, the pixies, yeah. Um, what else uh, can I play? Um, well, as of right now, through the stretch goals, adding more in there, mm-hmm. um, fattening up the book and paying for the artwork to uh, make these uh, and and the layout to do those those lovely character playbooks. Um, we've got like right right now we've got brownies, fawns, uh, humans, imps, pixies, redcaps, stonekin, which are rock people. Mm-hmm. Uh, sylphs and wildkin and woodkin. Oh my god! Now, uh, are red caps mushrooms? No, red caps are like short, kind of combative fey that are kind of misunderstood. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, they, they dip their, they dip their hats in the blood of uh, the things that they defeat in battle. Oh, and that keeps keeps their caps red. Oh, okay. That was darker than I thought red caps were. <laughs> okay, never mind. When I thought of yeah, red... Well, imps, imps and red caps are both a little, yeah. Yeah. A little darker. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, when I thought of red caps, I was like, oh, maybe they're like mushroom people with the red caps on their head. And they can be fungi. Hey, uh, you know, in, in, in your house ruled version of go for it. I don't I'm not the boss of and, you. And and they <laughs> still dip the tops of their heads in the blood of their enemies. Yeah, there's a, a little tiny mushroom person walking around with blood dripping off their head. Yeah, yeah. It's not any less disconcerting than no, a fae with blood dripping off their head. No, it really isn't. That's, that's uh, probably a little more disconcerting. Yeah. Especially no. if they're only about a foot tall. Yeah. 
I know that there's going to be some people that would be walking out seeing like just a walking mushroom with just blood dripping off the top of the, of the, the cap, thinking to themselves, that that's still edible. No, well, I could wash that right off. Oh yeah, no, yeah, it wash it. It washes off. It's all good. Wash it's it off, fry it up. It'll be it'll be fine. A little seltzer, you'll be fine. <laughs> a little salt, little butter, just saute it right up. Oh yeah, it's de- it's delicious. Glad I went there. What I was wondering though, are you seeing these more as one shots, or these are more like campaigns? It almost sounds like. I could see you. You could do it either way. I mean, okay, they, they play a little differently. You, you know, one shot versus campaign. Um, I've had people run um, a game that they told a complete story in an hour. Mm. Admittedly, it was one GM, one player, so that you didn't have as much time spent with other characters and players and their doings. But, you know, typically I run a game that runs like two to three hours, tells a complete story with like four players. One shots, you know, certainly work very well. I mean, my suggestion with a one shot is start out with a character that's a little more advanced, just so you have more to play with for that one game sure. um, maybe even have a corruption you know people I, I found that in one shots people tend to be um more willing to use corruptions and mark shadow and everything because it's a one shot it's like i'm not going to lose my character mm-hmm. in this one game but in a campaign where you play longer then it starts to become you know people start to pl- pay a little more attention to like whether or not they they let themselves mark that shadow and they spend spirit to stop to stop that occasionally because they right. know that at some point it's going to kind of bite them in the butt. Yeah, I, I guess the reason why I was thinking that this all, almost felt like more of a campaign game was just how many things that I would have to mark for character progression. Uh, yeah. Because it looks like you have 10 slots. I mean, imagine if you were doing house rules or you're doing something smaller. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't mark 10. Maybe you mark Already less, but... way ahead of you. Really? Uh, in the game, there's what's referred to as the intensity dial, where you can take those 10 spots and you can rein them back to 8 or 7 or even to 5 and play the game a little differently. Like, if you want your character to advance faster, like you're, you know, fill in 5 of those boxes for skill permanently and just fill up 5 to gain, you know, to advance your character. If you want characters to tread the line of corruption very quickly, mm-hmm. you know, reduce the shadow track. Um, so you can play the game like very, very long term where it's going to take a long time to get through everything. Or you can play like a shorter campaign where you tighten all those tracks up mm-hmm. um, and, and, and get to the meat faster because you're going to, you know, like maybe you're going to play a campaign that you're only planning it to be like six or seven game sessions. Sure, um, sure, absolutely. And you want to have a chance to hit some of that stuff. Oh, that's good. Okay, so you did actually like have uh, alternate rules essentially. If uh, I can play. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, And I could do that with uh, any individual one. Like, I don't, like, I could say, well, maybe a shadow's just, like, uh, five spots. Uh, But skill, yeah, you still need to do the ten. (laughs) Do it however you want. I'm not going to come over there and slap you around if you do it a different way than I would. (laughs) Well, you're too busy for that. (laughs) You you have that 355 games you have to make. Like, there's, there's nothing says all the tracks have to be the same length. Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, excellent. What would be, um, like, I, I, you've playtested it, I'm sure, quite a bit. Um, what are some of the examples that you would give of a campaign or a, a scenario that you would give to a party in this game? Um, well, there, yeah, there's... The, the idea behind the game is to not be... And and you can probably tell this from kind of like the fact that everybody's building the world together and it uses like a lot of these fantastical creatures that aren't necessarily that common as playable um, types in a lot of games. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm trying, I try to do that with the, what the the stories might be about too. Uh, In the GM section, there's a whole bunch of two page story schemes, which is basically like a two page adventure outline. Okay. Um, that gives you the basic idea. Here's a little bit of the background. Here's what the adventure is about and what the characters have to do. And then it's a whole bunch of inspirations. Like here's NPCs. Here's questions to ask the players. Here's mm-hmm. some challenges that you can throw at them. Um, some of the things are a little more fleshed out. Um, and you can just kind of craft a story out of that. Mm. If you played enough of those camp, enough of those stories, you could develop a campaign out of them easily enough. And there's even a couple of story schemes in there that are designed for like specific types of like there's one story scheme that is like this is this is the story scheme. This is the adventure you use to wrap it up. 
Okay. This is the one. This is where you defeat the void once and for all. And everything that's in that story scheme is kind of dependent d- dependent on the idea that you've had all of these other stories before. Because you're going to bring stuff back. Oh, there's going to be NPCs are going to return. Themes are going to return. Got it. Okay. Um, but then in amongst the stories themselves, um, it the, the the schemes that are in there range everywhere from straight up, you know, uh, slay the dragon. Mm-hmm. Um, the void has unleashed a terrible dragon on the world, and it's it's burning and killing and all this stuff. Um, two stories that are about dealing with refugees from one kingdom that's been decimated, and all the all the survivors come to this other kingdom that's not prepared for them. Uh, and everybody there is fearful that the people that are coming in are tainted by the void, and there's a lot of uh, xenophobia. So you're you know you're trying to want, basically the whole adventure is about integrating the the two peoples Mm -hmm. um so it it runs the gamut then you know there's some that's a little more mystical and weird there's like one that's more of a that's kind of a dungeon crawl that's imposed kind of on the characters the characters find themselves in an underground thing underground uh you know uh uh, maze um you know there's there's a variety so you could you could do almost anything that's kind of in the fantastical realm uh with 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 good strong hands i mean i it sounds like you know a dungeon crawls not off the table you're almost like campaign style you know adventures not really off the table i could pretty much do anything and i get to play an otter at the same time sure okay good yeah you can and there's 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 stories that are like you're saving a a, a massive city there's stories where you're putting um ghosts to rest from a battlefield um, where, you know, many people died fighting the void ages ago. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, you know, where you're, there's, there's a story where you're um, saving villagers from terrible nightmares mm. um, brought on by the void. So there's, yeah, there's, you know, lots and lots of things, but the idea was that I wanted it to be a lot of variety and it's not just going to be like the game. There, there are certainly, um, there's certainly an opportunity if you want to play kind of combat oriented, there can be hacky slashy kind of stuff, but sure. there's not a lot, there's not a lot of abilities that are built around that kind of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. your talents and stuff, they aren't all, you know, you don't have a, a ton of combat capabilities. There's no tactical battle map kind of action to it. Um, not that you couldn't put minis down on a map if you wanted to, when you do have a fight, um, sure. just to keep track of things, but there's not like rules for like flanking and all that sort of thing. Um, gotcha. You know, it's uh, I I I would envision that it'll be played a lot of different ways, but I think that the people who are nostalgic for some of the movies that the this is inspired by mm-hmm. will latch onto that some of the kind of fantastical, magical, mystical stuff that isn't necessarily just. Uh, combat centric right i am going to take a wild stab that one of those properties that was inspired for this was a never-ending story absolutely <laughs> the, the void is just the the void is just the nothing the, renamed yeah 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 it's the, the it title and the title of the book is straight out of rock biter's mouth yeah yeah well when you said that there was now like a a rock person class i was like well see that makes a lot of sense <laughs> um, so so there's that um and uh but now can i ride a luck dragon that's the only thing i really need to know now <laughs> why not exactly i i don't have one statted up in the game because you don't need it statted up in the game because all the rules are player facing so like if the gm wants to introduce a luck right. dragon and you want to ride it using body to guide it or or charm to befriend it or whatever oh well, yeah yeah and you, Falcor <laughs> doesn't need Falcor doesn't need stats. Falcor is so much above stats at this point. You know, <laughs> what, what what stats would you give to Falcor? Falcor snubs his nose at your stats. He's he's the luck dragon. He doesn't need stats. He's that, that that's 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 beyond. Him. <laughs> it's got to be fun when you get to be powerful enough that it's like stats. Pff, I don't need those. I don't need a stat block. Or you just design a game where you don't have to have a bunch of stats because it's a lot of extra crap for the GM to deal with. And I yes. wanted a game that was more story oriented and the GM can just kind of focus on letting the players uh, help develop the world and kind of building a fantastic thing. Is that why you developed this that way? <laughs> with, part of it. Part of it. 
<laughs> well, and part of it too is like it's designed for online play. It's intended to be good oh, yeah. at online play. Yeah, yeah. Um, because once you know the rules, a player just needs that two that two page uh, playbook for their character. A GM just needs a two page um, story scheme. If you know the rules, yeah. that's all you need. Like the GM doesn't have to manage a bunch of source books. They don't have to deal with minis and maps. They don't have to be flipping pages on a lot of different stuff and keeping track of stats for seven monsters and four NPCs. Oh yeah. Um, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I think that that is like from my experience of playing online games, unless the person is really like intimately familiar with a system um there's there is going to be quite a bit of like flipping through books and trying to <laughs> trying to look up resources quickly online absolutely uh i'm lucky enough that the one game that i'm playing in right now the person running it is on the board of directors for the company <laughs> that makes it so she's pretty familiar with the game <laughs> but if it was me trying to tell you what to do we would be there for a very long time just trying to figure out rule sets. Because <laughs> <laughs> I barely understand what's going on. So actually, Good Strong Hands was probably made mostly for me. For yeah, I did. Yeah. It's, it's dedicated to you. Okay, good. Um, there are multiple NPCs that are named after you. Great. No, there's none, there's none of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, but, I, uh, yeah, I... If you're looking for a game that is a little lighter on the rules and yeah. like, invites you to... Just create a wonderful world together and, and then save it. Yeah. Um, it's the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, I knew that you were kidding, but for a second I was like, wait. <laughs> and then I was like, no, 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 obviously. Yeah, yeah, as, as much fun as it is being completely in the dark and just kind of like going with the flow, I do actually really like to understand what the system is <laughs> when I'm playing. So, uh, and actually from just like looking at the example page that you give me for the character playbook um like instantaneously i understand basically how to play this game <laughs> like like this is this is actually very straightforward for me uh to figure out uh, the the only thing that wouldn't necessarily be explained right here is what i'm rolling for dice but you've already explained that so um so that's easy enough for me i just now have to make sure i have enough d6s um, oh, I'm sure that that's that's what's gonna keep you from playing a game. <laughs> that I just don't have the D six. No, I'm. You don't have six D six. I I don't have six D six around. I don't know what I'm gonna do. No, no. And okay, we'll go buy it. Buy, buy buy a Yahtzee game. Yeah, I'm just taking out of that. Five sixths of the way there. You're five sixths of the way there. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I have the the polyhedron dice sets, so I got like one in each one of those. <laughs> just, sure. Just put them all together. Uh, no. Was the idea behind using a d6 for your dice the fact that it's so ubiquitous among people? Like, you don't have to have polyhedral dice sets to have d6s lying around. Usually, Everybody, if you're everywhere. if you're a gamer, you have a crap ton of it. If you're not a gamer and you want to try to get into gaming, and this is like just like a story oriented thing where everybody's just kind of telling a story and there's not a lot of rules, um, mm -hmm. you probably have the dice in in the house, you know, yeah. just between your amongst your uh, more more typical board games. Yeah, uh, either you do or they sell like the d6s as sets <laughs> as well. You can also buy them anywhere. You can absolutely. Anywhere. You can buy a bunch of D6s at a convenience store at a gas station mm -hmm. next to the deck of cards. Yeah, go to, um, you know, a casino and just uh, when, when they tell you to roll the dice, just, just pocket the dice, <laughs> just run away. You'll have all the dice that you want. No, I don't actually yeah. advise you to do that because that's, that's not terrible. going to end well. <laughs> Sounds like someone needs an ass whooping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of and and really, what a sad way to go out. Well, I I committed theft at a casino. Oh my god! What did you try to steal? Dice. <laughs> and then you get your ass kicked uh, uh, in jail yeah. for that yeah. too. Nobody nobody respects you for that. No one respects you for that. No. And it's not like you can roll your dice to try and get out of that situation. It's not like you're actually in the game. That would be a very meta concept for a scenario, though, that you you got uh, locked in a jail in your fantasy setting because <laughs> you because you tried to steal dice 
and then you try to roll your dice to get out of the jail cell. I'm going to try to pick the lock. <laughs> yeah, but I can't actually pick the lock. I can just roll dice to see if I'm good I, at lock picking. Saying that I'm going to pick the lock. <laughs> yeah. that the would... other prisoners are looking at you. Oh, what is wrong? This I'm person. seeing if I can pick the lock, okay? But you don't even have a lock pick set. Just let me dream. And you're just rolling dice on the ground. I don't tell you how to live your life. Yeah. It's like, ooh, success. I picked the lock. Why is the door still closed? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the wonderful blurring of the line between the fantasy and the reality of the situation. Anyway, uh, so uh, Good Strong Hands is uh, on Kickstarter right now. When does the campaign end, Craig? On Thursday, October 22nd. Thursday, October 22nd. Coming right up. Two, week, two weeks from today as we record. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and just a teeny bit shorter uh, when this comes out. It's not too many days away, actually. But you still have time to get in. Uh, what are some of the um, tiers? Pretty straightforward. $20 gets you the PDF with every stretch goal and all the support material and whatnot that goes with it. $40 gets you all of that plus a hardcover. And $60 gets you all of that. And your hardcover is a signed Kickstarter exclusive fancy schmancy cover that uh, will never be available for retail. So if you're the type of person who likes the cool, cool, cool stuff. Mm. Um, and we have a, we have a stretch goal that's based on backer number, the number of people getting the book specifically, that if we get uh, enough people getting the book, and I think we're going to do it, we will upgrade from it being a print-on-demand book to being um, an actual print run. Oh. Um, nice. And if we go print run, then that, uh, that fancy-schmancy hardcover will be like leatherette with foil stamping and an alternate design. And Oh, boy. Super cool. People who have the money to spend, but you can yeah. also just get a regular hardcover, or you can just get the PDF. Yes. If you are the person who have, like, your own library, you want to have the nice fancy books on the library shelf. Okay. And I haven't shown anybody the cover design yet, and I'm really excited about it. It's, it's oh, very cute. different from the, the, the main book cover. Here's, here's your scoop. I try to give a scoop to every podcast that I'm on. Great. Um, uh, the main cover, you know, is, like, more of a traditional kind of illustration cover of, of characters doing things with the title. Um, the, uh, if, if, well, not if, I mean, no matter what the, uh, fancy hardcover, the going to be a, a design. It's not an illustration. Say that. Okay. It's not just an illustration of characters. It's a, it's kind of a cool design that kind of exemplifies the game and what it's about. Oh, very nice. It, it might, it might be heraldry. Like what's being designed uh, for the book. I could see it being as heraldry on a banner example oh, or a tabard okay i i can i can kind of envision it in my head right now and i i'm liking this very much very cool yeah and I, I also appreciate that the tier levels are so straightforward because sometimes it it gets a little bogged down i've seen yeah, i've seen kickstarters get, with like 25 different levels <laughs> and I it starts to feel a little too much like when they're they're trying to sell me like a video game with all the different special edition packages <laughs> Yeah. When you when you gotta have a spreadsheet on the page yeah. to, just, to, to to clarify <laughs> what things come with each yeah. record level, yeah. And they, don't get me wrong, there are there are companies out there that do that and they do it really well. Yeah, Monty Cook Games is really solid at it. They have great products and they they offer like tiers that do all sorts of different combinations. Sure. But boy, oh boy, that's that can get complicated. <laughs> like, oh boy, what do I want? Yeah, and especially because you have to you know manage the what is it now five hundred and seventy eight or so games that you're making. You know you have to yeah. you have to try and keep things a little bit more straightforward and simple. So that's good. And I think that that lends itself very well to you know just how you lay out. Uh, books like Good Strong Hands to try and make them, you know, straightforward and and easy to understand. Your backer levels kind of exemplify that as well. I don't know if that was by design, but I don't I don't screw around. I keep it simple. You keep it simple. <laughs> so no, it's a straightforward game. I kept the uh, the Kickstarter as straightforward as possible. Yeah, yeah. So what you got to do? This is my this is my new idea for a game for you. Is uh, <laughs> it is is like old. But uh, you call it Kiss, and it's the Keep It Simple Stupid, and it is it is an RPG about building RPGs. It's Sounds RPG terrible. section. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Look, know that I would like playing that. 
it, it's, it's, yeah. I suppose you could probably come up with something. I don't know. It, it'd be very, it would be very <laughs> tongue in cheek. It would be a little bit closer to probably like die laughing. I LARP, I LARP that game like nearly every day. Yes. <laughs> it's very, very convincing. My LARP, my, my role playing game design LARP is very convincing. And there's a lot of bleed. It definitely bleeds over into the rest of my life. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of people playing along with you, uh, it, to, <laughs> to be honest. It, we're just not all in the same place. We're, we're, not, we're not using in, the same rule set. No, no, we're not. We're no, it's always a different rule very set. Very free form. Yep. Very free, very free form. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a very oh, like yeah. straightforward set of, of mechanics. You, you kind of make the mechanics up as you go along. <laughs> Craig, if uh, folks out there wanted to find out more information uh, about Good Strong Hands or any of the stuff that you do, where could they go? Uh, well, for the next couple of weeks, you can go to Kickstarter uh, and search Good Strong Hands or use the link that uh, that uh, Elv will provide. Mm -hmm. um, Outside of that, I am at Nerdburger Craig on Twitter. Uh, there's NerdburgerGames.com where um, I've got all sorts of stuff going on there, um, including um, a store and whatnot. Include which which also includes the uh, the fancy capers hardcover, the deluxe hardcover that we made, um, and then um, also everything is available at DriveThroughRPG.com. Perfect. And uh, as for us and everybody who listens to the show probably already knows this, you can find everything that we do over at DelveCast.com. Uh, in addition to this show and some of the other shows that I do and some of the other videos that I make, uh, yeah, everything, everything is right over there. Including, when you see this post, uh, links, yes, to the Kickstarter, and uh, I'll try to throw a link in there too for uh, Nerdburger Games as well, so that we have those uh, readily available when you visit the site. Well, woohoo! Woohoo, indeed. And while you are there, maybe go and click on our Patreon. Uh, over there, we do some extended stuff, as well as uh, some things that I just put out there early and uh, stuff that I don't necessarily put on to the normal site. So you can check it all out there. And uh, make sure to follow us on Twitter as well. Uh, I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delph Podcast. So follow along if you want to know immediately when things come on.